live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech on a given, what is it, Wednesday. And we're talking today about how the reopening is going for tourism in Hawaii. You know, I mean, it's been a problem in my lifetime anyway that, the, you know, that tourism and the regular, the regular community are kind of separated. But we really have to care about tourism now. Tourism is the engine of our economy. What goes on in Waikiki and the tourism industry affects all of us, and increasingly so. It is what makes this state tick. Don't forget. Okay, so we got to we got to talk to people who who do know about what's going on in Waikiki, like Allison Schaefer's from the Star Advertiser. She reports on it. She's star reporter, and that's her beat: Waikiki and tourism. And she knows so much about it. It's really amazing and wonderful to have her on the show. Thank you so much, Allison, for coming around. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jay. Thank you. So, it, you know, you had this uh, really interesting article. It was uh, a couple of days ago. It was really valuable to read it because it, it gave us a window inside what was going on with the hotels, big and little. Uh, and for that matter, other businesses that were accessory to the hotels. So can you talk first about the hotels? As I'm, I'm you know, looking at the article, there are 270 major hotels uh, in, I guess, Waikiki, or maybe that's the state. Um, and uh, a lot of them are, mm, well, they're not doing business. What's the story? Um, okay, so the 270 number is from a list of lodging, maybe the top lodging accommodations across the state. So that's if you take the top uh, hotels and timeshares and condo hotels. Um, okay. So of that number, less than half are currently open. And um, one of the things that's interesting, I spent some time computing that yesterday, if you um, take a look at who's closed, only about 40% um, were planning to um, reopen for the August 1st even. Um, so we still have about 142 properties out of that 270 that are closed and only about 40% of them were gonna reopen for August 1st. Other, um, other ones, and they're a lot of the big box, big brand, large properties, um, are waiting longer because in a lot of ways, um, reopening, if you've got a, a huge property with huge infrastructure um, and energy costs, it's more expensive to reopen at very limited um, mm -hmm. occupancy. Yeah. Some of them, some of them have taken um, the approach of um, uh, refurbishing the hotel. A um, couple of them you mentioned in the article, including I'm remembering the Holly Kalani for one, um, and they, they don't plan to reopen. They might have reopened earlier if there wasn't all this um, up and down uh, about uh, you know lockdown and then you know, reopening and then lockdown. But they, they're talking about the middle of 2021 now. Is right. that, what, what's going on at, there? If you look at a property like the Holly Kalani, um, they have a huge um, inflow typically from Japan. Um, and well, Hawaii has been working on trying to um, get a travel bubble or a travel corridor with Japan. Um, we like their low numbers and we thought they would like ours. Um, the issue is it's really hard for um, any other country to separate Hawaii from the rest of the U.S. And so well, we're working on uh, bringing, uh, trying to formulate travel agreements with places like Japan and Korea. New Zealand, Australia that have uh, like-minded philosophies about COVID and limited case numbers. We have those, those are the bubble, bubble countries, right? Those are the bubble countries, but we're not, um, you know, everybody says, oh, well, let's just reopen the bubble countries. We feel like we'd rather have those visitors back than the U.S. visitors, which is our core market. But here's the thing, you know, they don't want us back right now. <laughs> and, and if a Japanese visitor were to come, um, they would have to quarantine to the to Hawaii, which is part of the U.S. They would have to quarantine for 14 days upon their return to Japan, and there's not very many people that you know want to do that. Um, yeah. And therein lies the problem with that. But you take a property like the Hale Kalani, and you take some of the main uh, Waikiki oceanfront, uh, far more heavily dependent on Japan than the rest of the state. And uh, that's not looking too promising. And so, um, yeah, I mean, at some point you have to look at your numbers and if your numbers are going to be too low uh, to make a profit at all, um, it, in some ways it suggests that maybe you're better off borrowing money or reinvesting so you can be repositioned for the future. Yeah, are any of these hotels uh, on the market? Uh, are they trading? Because I mean, if I'm a, 
if I'm a hotelier that's not making any money and I don't see a way out of this, at least not for the short or intermediate term, my first thought is going to be um, to find a buyer and get um, out of the business. Yeah, I think, I, you know, in other times we've seen that. I think it's an, a little early yet. Um, one thing, the lenders have still been working with um, a lot of the properties. I think uh, statewide, we have probably somewhere between 40 and 50 properties that are on um, the, the, you know, the watch list the, for the commercial back securities. Um, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily in default, but it might mean that, you know, they've got some sort of an arrangement. So they're being studied. But honestly, when it comes to hotels, most of these lenders, they don't want to take back a hotel that's, that's, it's hard to run them anyway. In the best of times, it's very mm -hmm. specialized. And when it's the worst of times, how is that going to be helpful to them? I understand um, from talking to the industry that most of the closed hotels um, are still losing between 1 million and 1.5 million every month just to be closed. So if you take that back as a lender, it's, it, that's not necessarily desirable either. No, no, no. Um, I think we'll see, um, we'll see some defaults um, if this carries on. I, I, I think we'll see some sales. Um, in the past, we've saw we've seen sales in these times. Um, Hawaii, being Hawaii, we haven't really seen fire sales. We tend to trade at a premium. I hope that still um, happens in the future. Um, you know, but if you look at other destinations, we're not necessarily um, any worse off. It's just that we depend more on tourism here than some other places. What about repurposing the hotels? I mean, for example, um, there was talk about. Uh, Make putting the homeless in them because uh, you know, the homeless are very exposed to COVID in their homeless way of living and um, and likewise uh, you know the issue of taking COVID patients I don't know if we've achieved that level of COVID patients but there was also talk about and in other places this has happened where the it hotels tend to be in, hotels for in, in other places. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say that the hotel industry is unwilling, but again that might be a little early. Um, if we see that in other places, what we've seen is that the government would tend to take out a contract at a particular hotel and more or less lease the space and the government is paying for this program. Um, from a hotelier standpoint, um, that's probably not the first way you want to recover your money. I mean, can you imagine being marketed later as the homeless hotel? Um, it doesn't exactly, um, it, you know, it it's not what people think of when they when you're having your travelers book a trip to Hawaii right. Um, right. or the COVID hotel for that matter this the you know there have been other properties that have turned into uh, places for quarantine or places for uh, COVID recovery or hospitalization uh, we may see that down the road I you know our numbers aren't such that we need that right now um, and and uh, you know I don't know though there may be if uh, we don't get these hospitality workers that to work, there might be an awful lot of new families that actually are part of the industry that are now homeless. What, um, so uh, what, what about um, now? Uh, you know, we have, we have the, um, the, the, the August date. Uh, we have this um, the potential hybrid of the quarantine and then the pre-testing on the mainland or wherever so that we can get a, a certificate um, you know, is that, how does that affect the market here? Does that build uh, confidence uh, in the public? Does it build, um, does it build uh, uh, hotel guests? Does it build the industry? Is it affecting things in any material way? Um, I, I think there were a lot of problems with the August 1st um, reopening uh, because they didn't really fill in a lot of the details quickly enough. Um, so actually, if I talk to a lot of the hotel industry, um, which is part of the reason I think we were only seeing about 40% of the hotels that were closed planning to reopen for that August 1st date, um, they were actually, a lot of them were seeing fewer um, bookings, so more cancellations for August and September than they were seeing future bookings. So it was going the reverse direction. A lot of that was, um, I've heard from uh, very disgruntled travelers, many who have rebooked their trips three times or more to Hawaii, um, without knowing at, at the time it was announced, without knowing if children would have to be tested, um, not knowing where to get a test, how much it was gonna cost, um, checking with their providers and finding out some of them wouldn't test unless you were sick. Some of the providers were saying they wouldn't, even CVS was telling people in some places, 
that they wouldn't get the test results back um, from, you know, it would be an average of five to 10 days. Um, and that's, you know, with the 72 hour window, um, that's pretty risky for a traveler to spend so much to come to Hawaii and then worry that um, if they, you know, don't get the test result, they would have to quarantine. Now, um, Governor Ige on um, Monday, when he um, rolled back the date to September 1st, he did answer a few details. He did say all children would have to be tested. That's pretty humbug. I don't think travelers will like that. Um, but the one thing that he did say that I'm getting some good feedback on is that if you take the test and you don't have it back in the 72 hour window, that uh, you could come here and quarantine until you got the result back and then you could be out of quarantine as long as it was negative. Hmm. Um, that's probably a pretty good compromise that will help. Yeah. I, I think the other issue with this, the pushback now, um, you know, it gives us a chance to restart uh, bringing tourists back, but I think that there's this perception that somehow the floodgates are going to open and we're going to have 10.4 million visitors or like last July, we had over almost a million visitors, um, uh, you know, nowhere near. Um, and part of the reason is some of the things that you and I had talked about before that um, travelers don't necessarily have confidence. Some people don't have confidence in traveling. It's going to depend on what level of confidence they have. And some of those things are out of Hawaii's hands. Some of it's the economic issue. A lot of it's the, um, you know, with um, COVID cases sweeping the mainland, especially the U some of the U.S. West states where we rely on 45% of our uh, visitor arrivals typically, um, that that is not conducive to thinking about planning a trip. If I'm told it's so dangerous, um, the California governor, and I live in California, is closing the bars and the restaurants, and he's going to you know make me stay home, I'm not thinking about booking a trip. So in some ways, um, this delay, we might have, we already missed the summer peak travel period for families. We might have missed another window because there was a time when COVID um, was not as active as it is now. Um, now we've got a more active period. So it's, it's hard to say, um, you know, when we reopen what that's going to look like. Yeah. But, you know, even on a good year, um, September, or October are not peak travel periods. Well, okay, uh, that, that gives me a tiny bit of comfort. <laughs> but you know what? Um, this, this thing about the quarantine, even when it was first adopted, I personally, I was skeptical. Why? Because most, um, my observation is that most tourists who come here do not come for as much as two weeks. They come for like a week, that's, that's the package. Um, and so how can you possibly spend two weeks in quarantine um, when you have hoped for um, getting out and doing stuff and getting out of your hotel room. Um, I, I just can't imagine that working. I can't imagine a tourist legitimately, sincerely intending to come here and spend two weeks in quarantine. Have they been doing that? Uh, or have they been breaking, breaking the rules? We know there are some quarantine breakers. Um, We've sent some of them back, including the, the what the last month it was the 21 members of the cult carbon nation on the big island. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think that the definitions of who is a visitor and who is a returning resident and who is an intended resident can be somewhat blurred. And I do think that there's a fair amount of people um, who might be originally from Hawaii or might have family in Hawaii that are either furloughed from their jobs for a very long time or have been laid off. And, and they may be coming and they may be willing to quarantine for a time. Um, if you're planning on staying you know, for the entire summer, two weeks at home is probably not so bad, especially if you came from a place where um, the lockdowns were worse or um, you had food or shelter insecurity, those types of things. Um, so it's really hard to say. We know that um, since April, they, uh, the COVID flight assistance program through the Visitor Aloha Society of Hawaii has sent back about 157 visitors who were not prepared to quarantine. And um, in some cases, it was, a, it was flagrant disregard. In some cases, it was just lack of knowledge. But in any case, um, Hawaii didn't pay for all those tickets, but they some in some cases they paid for the whole ticket or a portion, and those people have been returned home. 
Um, oh yeah, I wanted to ask you that. So yeah, so I have a ticket. It's a return ticket. The dates are fixed. This is a problem. You know, the airlines are pretty inflexible about that. And uh, I, I get here, I violate the quarantine. Uh, the state of Hawaii tells me I got to leave. And you say this, the state is paying their way back. That means me as a taxpayer, I'm paying their way back. In some cases, um, like say somebody comes um, and they don't have any money or any means. Um, the only other alternative is to put them in our prison. Um, so in well, some that, cases that's really more expensive <laughs> that might be more expensive um all i don't know out of the 157 how many have gotten full freight sometimes the help is just getting their flight the, the airline to allow them to return and and the state hasn't spent any money on that so yeah. I, you know it just depends um what, what about the airlines you know we spoke about public confidence and all that What's the state of affairs on the middle seat right now? Um, if, if I want to have confidence, I'd like to see the airlines make it as safe as they can for me. I'd like to see the guy at my right and my left wearing a mask all the way through, and I'd like to see an empty seat. It's, it's not a complete solution, but it, at least it gives me some confidence that the airline cares. Well, you know, I think that's um, all the airlines are taking some steps to restore public confidence. Some are doing more things than others, and it varies slightly. I think most of the carriers are requiring masks. Uh, the middle seat, originally, most of the carriers had committed to it. I understand a couple carriers have uh, bowed out of that and are already booking middle seats. So, um, you know, I think it's it's like anything else. It, the onus is on the consumer to double check before you book and uh, brands are different for a reason. So um, it, you, certainly if you want to come to Hawaii and you don't want the middle seat to be filled, there are some carriers who are flying without a middle seat at this point. I, I don't think though that um, that's going to be the uh, travel of the future. It's not sustainable for the carriers to be able to afford that. Um, you know, I think currently right now the load factors are so small that it's not as big of a deal. Um, later, they're going to need some revenue coming in, especially when they don't have the federal bailouts. Um, so I think, you know, we can expect to see that for a little bit, um, but I don't know for how long into the future. Yeah, well, I hope we got to recover on this. I mean, uh, you know, what, I'd like to talk to you about the factors uh, that, that enter into this decision process by the government and by the hotels. I mean, one is the union and all those people, uh, was it Local 5? Uh, we had them on a show a couple of months ago, and they were very concerned about their people, as they should be. Um, and, you know, the query whether they had the deep pockets to keep on paying benefits uh, on an indefinite basis. And then you have the hotels themselves. They are a serious lobbying force. Um, they don't mind going down to the legislature. They don't mind talking to the governor and so forth. And uh, they're going to be asking for reopening. They're going to be asking for every opportunity to get back in, in normal. Um, how, how is that working? Because, um, you know, it may not be the best thing for the state in general. People outside the tourism industry may be, may be worried about that. Uh, and, you know, wh where, is the, where is the political and economic influence on this? Where is it coming from and how effective is it? People worried about, I, I'm just wanting to make sure I understand your question. People outside the visitor industry worried about what in particular? Well, they worry about some, some guy coming here right now, quarantine or not, and bringing the virus. Uh, they worry about, for example, testing a person, finding a person who is sick, testing that person, tracing that person, tracing everybody he talked to, and finding out what, you know, where the infection went from him into our community. I'm, I'm not sure we're doing that. So that's the concern of the person outside. And then on the other side of it, the hotels want to reopen, I think. Um, and the union wants them to reopen, I think. So where's the, where's the tension on that? I think there are a lot of details to still be worked out. Um, obviously, we're try they're trying to come up with the September 1st now reopening plan that has some rules that you would be subject to a pre-arrivals test and that if you didn't have the negative result, you would have to quarantine when you got here. Obviously, we know that's not a foul-proof method because in many ways, as you pointed out, the quarantine is um, it's a it's mandatory, but it's still kind of on the honor system. Um, 
we could do something different. Other destinations have. Um, some people are pushing for that in Hawaii. Um, ultimately, I don't know, you know, if that will get any traction or not. Um, there are destinations like I think Cambodia is one of them that if you go, um, you're required to do about a three thousand dollar deposit um, that pays for your quarantine hotel and all of your meals until you're out of quarantine and. Um, you know, they take that stuff very seriously. There's some destinations that are doing that. Other destinations are requiring a second COVID-19 test um, with the idea that if you stay more than a few days here that they would want just to make sure that you didn't pick up COVID-19 on the flight or in some other, um, uh, you know, if, if, if it, uh, or even before you got here that you, in the window between the test and, and you getting on the flight that you, it, it didn't materialize. Um, and, you know, certainly those are things that we could do. Um, there's a bit of an outcry from the visitor industry. They don't want to see that because they feel like um, if we make it too onerous that visitors won't want to come back and they're not looking at very many visitors returning uh, as it is. I mean, I was on a conference call earlier today with uh, Local 5 and um, even for the August 1st reopening, some of the bigger properties were talking only about bringing about 12% of the workforce back. Um, and that's based on, they think their occupancy is gonna be about 12%. And then they thought the next month they would bring back 20% and then 30% and then maybe 40%. From what I'm hearing in the industry, we're not expecting to see 50% you know, occupancy into it maybe in the holiday frame if we're lucky but probably not until next year yeah it's pretty serious now because our economy is dependent on tourism not just the hotels but all the accessory you call them accessory um you know businesses in your article um and i and i really wonder if uh, if we have a sense if people in general have a sense and whether you have a sense of how profound the damage will be on a long-term basis you know if you extend this whole this whole process into September and October. Oh my gosh. And then of course there's the Christmas season where you know so many people come here and we may not have that. If, it, if it's a function of the vaccine, I'm not sure we will have the confidence necessary to bring those people over here by the, by the millions essentially. Um, they're not here. What happens to the rest of us? Because that money you know, feeds through the whole economy, keeps us all going. And if we don't have jobs and we don't have that money filtering through the economy, Gee whiz, what happens to Hawaii? Fact is, it's the engine, engine of our economy. So you must be thinking about that. What, what do you think is going to happen here? Because we have no immediate solution. There's talk about vaccine and a therapeutic, but no immediate solution. And if you had to make an optimistic guess, you would say, well, sometime in the spring. Can this industry last until the spring? Not without some additional bailouts or support. And certainly the people can't. I, I think part of the problem um, that that we have in Hawaii is it's, you know, it, but it's not just Hawaii, it's everywhere. People find it hard to pivot. You know, we went into this, we started the year out with um, the lowest resident sentiment towards tourism ever. We had 10.4 million arrivals um, that brought in about uh, $18 billion in visitor spending, but on a, um, on an adjusted basis, it was really only about what we've had um, when we were bringing in, you know, 6.5 million visitors or so. And uh, because of that, and because there were pockets of the community that were feeling um, over tourism, there there was a lot of a resident sentiment against that. And um, the natural inclination, I think, now, and, it, and it's a wise one, is to take a look at um, how we can rebuild tourism in a way that would be um, favorable and it would take into account um, some parameters that would make people feel like there was less tourism. The problem is um, we really started discussions about rebuilding tourism um, probably too, too late in the cycle and now we're entering a phase of desperation. Um, you know, it works when you take some time to think about adjusting a destination. And the reason I say that is, look at Kauai. They were shut down for, uh, the North Shore of Kauai was shut down for more than a year uh, because of mass flooding. And when they reopened, they put into place a tourism management plan for Hainan State Park that 
really did help that community um, feel a little bit less um, overburdened and overtaxed by all the cars along the roadway and uh, you know not being able to go to their own natural attractions. We could do that for the state of Hawaii too, but um, I think we, we've gotten into the situation where those discussions should have been taking place immediately as we collapse tourism, as well as the discussion of how do we start bringing it back. But we were so panicked about just trying to be safe, and I understand that, that um, now we're kind of playing catch up and it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, you talked about people being afraid, um, you know, with tourists um, coming, and, you know, I definitely get that, but without a pre-arrival testing program or some um, protocol in place, what we're left with is basically um, a quarantine model, because we cannot stop U.S. people at this point from coming to Hawaii. It's a state, and as an American citizen, you have a right to go to any state that you choose to. Um, and so we cannot stop people from coming into Hawaii. We can insist that they follow the quarantine, which they may or may not. Or, you know, we could put in a testing program um, and we, we might get a few more visitors. And we would hope that, you know, probably the visitors that would be willing to jump through those hoops are a more compliant and well-heeled sort of visitor. Because I'm hearing that the test will probably cost anywhere from 150 to 300 dollars a pop and so if you're looking at that that's the sort of visitor that hawaii typically has said we want fewer visitors coming that are able to spend more while they're here mm -hmm. um you know but beyond that um the whole delivery aspect of it is something we have to talk about too um when a visitor gets here if things are not open if they have to wear a mask everywhere they go, um, if the residents aren't welcoming because they don't want them here because there's not that confidence, um, if they can't get housekeeping in their hotel rooms, if they don't have valet service, if they, you know, it, it, we're gonna have the other issue of what kind of an experience can we provide for them? So these are all discussions that need to be taking place as we head into the September 1st reopening. And hopefully, um, since we had the August 1st start and stop, that gave them a little bit of a head start on preparing. Um, because, you know, last week we certainly weren't prepared for the August 1st reopening um, with less than a month in. And so hopefully with, you know, now that there's a little bit more time, they'll work out some of those details. Um, Hope so. It's a matter of rebranding, you know, it's not so easy. It's a matter, for example, of putting ultraviolet light in these hotels, um, you know, to kill virus. They do it in hospitals, they can do it in hotels. And if I'm a, a tourist and, and they tell me, oh, yeah, uh, you know, between visitors, we go through the, every room and we use ultraviolet light, I, 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 I feel better about it. Uh, that's a branding issue. And I, I want to think that Hawaii is not only clean, but super clean. Um, but let me ask you my last question, Allison, because we only have a few minutes left then. It's probably the toughest question of all, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you mentioned that this is a time to think and maybe reimagine what tourism is like in Hawaii. This is the time, not later when we're you know, in greater trouble, not later when a lot of companies and tourism organizations have folded. Um, and so you know, I, I'm a little worried, for example, about uh, Ala Moana. That's an accessory retail establishment. It's directly connected to tourism, of course. Now there's talk about building condos in part of Ala Moana instead of having shops. Um, now that's troubling in the sense that uh, those condos are not necessarily going to be for local people, are they? They're going to be for investors offshore in Asia and whatnot. Um, so you say, well, that, oh, that's a change and that maybe that comports with, you know, the dynamic of, um, you know, of the, of the new world, of the new COVID world. Um, but it's not necessarily uh, something I would treasure myself. Um, and so the question is, what do you what do you see for tourism in, in the new post COVID world when the problem is solved and people start coming back and we have to rebrand ourselves and uh, attract tourists, uh, maybe not in the same numbers and and integrate that tourist experience with the, you know, the, the, the local community somehow make it all harmonious. How do you envision tourism in Hawaii when we get through this thing, the other side of the tunnel? Um, you know, I think what has always been 
special about Hawaii is the culture and the environment. Um, I think that that needs to be front and center, um, you know, and that those are going to be some of the discussions probably. Um, there are destinations in the world like the Galapagos Islands and places like that where people are willing to pay a premium to go for a very special, very um, unique, very exclusive experience. And, you know, that may be more where we're headed. Um, I, the mass, um, mass tourism of, of Hawaii, when we opened it up for jet travel and anybody can come to Hawaii, um, you know, they'll still, I think they'll still be, a, that'll still be a part of the tourism economy, but maybe less so um, as we try to pivot into more what the community would like to see. Um, I, I know that they're launching campaigns right now and, and or starting, or starting to go towards that direction. And what they're hoping for are appealing to visitors who um, care about Hawaii, that want to do what's right for this place while they're here and are already invested in our destination. Um, so, you know, hopefully those are some of the discussions that are taking place. You know, how do we make our rules and lockdowns get us to there rather than um, just using them to stop travel? How do we use them to reopen travel in a way that we would like to see it reopened? Yeah. Ah, Allison, great to talk to you. Uh, you know, there's a long road here and it's still going to be central no matter what happens uh, to the state of Hawaii. And you're going to be there. You're going to be on it. You're going to be reporting from it. And uh, we hope we can check in with you from time to time and see what's happening. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, Jay. Thanks so much. Aloha, Allison. Aloha.